You're watching Global Insights, where we speak to experts from around the world on issues making headlines. I'm also young. More people are spending time on social media than ever before, and we're pressured to build bigger networks, establish an online presence, and follow constant updates and whatever's trending. And whether you think that makes us more engaged or distracted, uh, whether that increases or disrupts real conversations, or whether unfiltered radical opinions broaden or narrow our understanding and empathy towards others, what's been undeniable is that there is less time and focus given to interactions in the real world. And we discussed the various issues surrounding social media and its impact on society. And we're very honored to have join us today, Jonathan Haidt, a social psychologist at New York University Stern School of Business, whose best-selling books, The Righteous Mind and The Happiness Hypothesis, have uh, generated a lot of conversation and soul searching on how we can get better at relating to others and also become stronger as societies. It's wonderful to have you with us again, Professor Haidt. Thank you so much for joining us. No, oh, thank you so much, Jenny. Pleasure to be back. Thank you so much. And well, what's been making a lot of headlines uh, in recent days is Elon Musk and his takeover of Twitter. And a few days ago, he uploaded a picture of a gun, actually two guns at his bedside table. And uh, he, of course, wrote a lot of posts about free speech and how the lack of it, according to him, leads to t uh, tyranny and the end of civilization. But um, perhaps he's barking up the wrong tree. But how should we really understand the role of free speech in society? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think he is barking up the wrong tree, um, because when speaking, of, when discussing the kinds of norms we need, nobody should just say, oh, we need free speech, period. You have to talk about what kind of institution are you talking about. And in the United States, we pioneered guaranteeing the right of free speech against the government. That is, Congress shall make no law restricting the freedom of speech. The government cannot tell us what to say or do. But I'm a professor. Can I control speech in my classroom? Of course, because we need certain kinds of speech to be productive in the classroom. In a, in a publicly traded company, you need different norms of speech. So I think what, uh, what Musk might say is that we should not censor particular ideological viewpoints, but of course we need to set norms uh, to, to have productive speech on Twitter. Right, because well, we're presumably, you know, Americans are upholding the value of free speech uh, for the purpose of strengthening democracy, not to uh, erode it. And well, uh, we see all these um, very outspoken people um, in charge of the likes of Twitter, also Facebook, people who aren't really known for their moral leadership. But now with more and more social interactions taking place on these online platforms and what we hear about uh, the metaverse uh, being used uh, mm. Is supposed to be taking over our lives. Um, what kind of future are we looking at? And do you think we need some kind of intervention in all this? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So uh, as an American, I come from the, the English or the Anglo-American tradition, which is about how um, societies get built up gradually. And there's a wisdom in that from gradual growth. Whereas if you try to design a society from scratch, usually it works very, very badly. Now, social media, Twitter, Facebook, and the coming metaverse, none of these were designed to be good societies. These were all designed as business models to serve advertisers. And they do a very good job serving their customers who are the advertisers. They're not very good for the people who go into them who are the product. Since more and more of our life is taking place in these virtual spaces, I think there is an urgent need for government agencies and public pressure groups to, to push for certain kinds of protections. For example, authenticating identities. You don't have to use your real name when you post, but I don't wanna be interacting with people who won't even show that they're a real human being. That doesn't help anybody. Right, and these uh, conversations that we're meant to be having, they're supposed to be um, enriching society and helping us become more productive and really serve a purpose. And these yeah. days though, um, well, in, <clears throat> here in South Korea anyway, uh, more frequent use of social media is seen as being more productive. But of course, we're seeing a lot of just random content and uh, people just uploading things all the time without what's, uh, 
you know, with an absence of particular purpose. Yeah. And well, you actually mentioned a study um, where uh, people who tend to spend more time on social media have uh, <coughs> higher, you know, personality traits related to narcissism, uh, sadism, sadism, mm -hmm. and even Machiavellianism. And well, what should we really take away from these results as a society? Yeah. So some people say that social media is just a mirror of society. And social media is not the problem, it just reflects back who we are. But this is clearly not true. And this study that came out recently, let me tell I have it nearby, the, the author is named Freyth. Um, social media use and personality beyond self-reports. Um, what they find is that the people who are heavy users tend to have personality disorders about narcissism, uh, Machiavellianism, manipulativeness, so what we see on social media is not a reflection of the entire population. It's especially people who are jerks, who are obnoxious, who are arrogant, who are performing. And this particular article talks a lot about sexual performance, by which I don't mean having sex. What I mean is people are trying to impress, especially men are trying to impress people. Women are trying to show off in different ways. So these platforms are not mirrors of society. They show us a very warped vision, and then people think, oh, that's the way people are, and that's wrong. So it distorts our values, uh, it, it damages trust, it increases depression, social comparison. Um, so my own view is that social media is incompatible. Social media, as it is now, is incompatible with liberal democracy, which has many known weaknesses, and social media targets many of those weaknesses creates distrust, fear, anger, and conflict. Right, because if we saw something weird or someone shouting random things on the street, we wouldn't pay attention to it. But on social media, though, that somehow becomes normalized. And some people seem to use uh, social media to really um, keep affirming themselves and look for this kind of identity. And there also seems to be a growing culture of uh, victimhood and blaming others or uh, the system. That seems rather popular these days. Uh, does this all, do, does it still lead to meaningful societal change though? Or do you think in some ways it's more mm. counterproductive? Yeah, I think it's very counterproductive. Um, if you are politically progressive, if you believe in social change, then you should say that we had extraordinary change, at least in the United States, I was born in 1963 when it was legal to discriminate against black people. And every decade since then, we've made incredible progress in civil rights for African Americans, in women's rights, in gay rights, in animal rights, in, in, in concerns about nature. I mean, the, the progress from 1963 when I was born to 2013 when I turned 50 was incredible. And then everyone got onto Twitter and Facebook and uh, uh, various other platforms the grievance mentality took over. Everyone is able to say they're a victim. People are rewarded for saying they're victims. And so this has particularly damaged the progressive movement, I believe, because progressive organizations tend to embrace this victimhood culture much more. Now, on the right, they tend not to, but actually now social media allows them to feel they're victims too. But the main, the main uh, problems, I think, have been found for young women who uh, were making huge progress until 2013. And now many feel that they're victims, they're oppressed, they're not gonna make as much money as a man, which isn't true. Um, so it's very bad for young women, it's increasing their depression, and it's very bad for the left politically because left-wing social groups are, are consumed with inner conflict. There have been many recent articles about this, that if you have a political group on the left, they spend all day long arguing about something somebody said. Exactly, and well, how then should we really uh, pursue actual uh, real progress that is beneficial for everyone? Um, well, I think that it's very important, first of all, to keep children off of social media. Part of the problem is that young people, now I'm just beginning to collect the data on Korea, but at least in all of the English speaking countries, what happens is uh, the levels of depression and anxiety are fairly stable from the early 2000s to 2012. And then all of a sudden, the rates of depression, anxiety, self-harm go way, way up for the girls especially. So we're creating a generation that is really broken, that is really damaged. Um, and it's gonna be very hard for Gen Z, that is people born after 1995, it's gonna be very hard for them to handle a diverse democracy where you have to argue and then compromise. That's very difficult for them because they didn't have a chance to do that when they were young. Um, so we have to 
prepare the next generation for democracy. And in America, we're doing a terrible job of that. Um, uh, we also need to strengthen our political institutions and our knowledge generating institutions. So I'm very concerned that American universities have been sort of, there's a kind of an ideological pressure to not criticize progressive ideas because if you do on social media, you will be destroyed and you, you, there could be a movement to get you fired from your job. So again, the, the, the victimhood, the, the conflict of social media has particularly harmed left-wing organizations. Now, it's made the right crazy. I mean, Donald Trump could never have been elected without Twitter. So it's, it's making both sides more extreme. And we can't have a liberal democracy if we don't have a responsible center-right party and a responsible center-left party. And in America now, we don't really have that, especially on the right. Right, and certainly in media as well, we need to see more uh, moderates uh, speaking on media, not just these extreme people shouting at each other in um, you know, the nightly news or something like that. And Well, uh, mm. the United Kingdom and Japan, they uh, appointed ministers of loneliness to actually tackle a feeling of uh, social isolation that people are feeling. And mm -hmm. well, this really actually reminded me of your book, The Happiness <coughs> uh, Hypothesis, which um, uh, my university, we actually studied um, in our undergrad years. Oh, and this really um, helped us understand how we need to uh, work on our relationship with others and improve what you called our mental hygiene. And uh, do, you think, uh, do you think creating these kind of ministers or ministries that could help towards that kind of effort? I mean, what kind of uh, mm -hmm. efforts are needed to really address the uh, impact yeah. of social media? Yeah. So I think that uh, it is a good idea to have a minister of, of relationships or not relationships, loneliness or flourishing or something. But I would urge that it not be primarily in psychology, not be primarily in clinical psychology, because if, it, if it's focused on helping people who are already depressed, you can help a little bit, but it, it's very hard. It should instead have a lot of sociologists and social psychologists, because the problems are structural. And I have some special words for Korea and for South Korean audiences. Um, so my wife is Korean American. I've traveled to Korea twice, and and I, I love the country. But I was shocked to see that children don't really have childhood. That children seem to spend their entire childhood preparing for exams. Um, what children need to grow up mentally healthy is play. Korea has stolen childhood. South Korea does not let children develop normal social skills in play. It's very important if you want your future generations to be happy and strong and able to work together. It's very important that you cut back on these ridiculous hagwans, that you cut back, uh, especially before the age of 10 or 12. Let them play. Give them much more time to play with each other. Um, that uh, And instead, what you do, which is what we do, is you, you don't let them out. Uh, and you give them phones when they're very young. So there's no real play. There's just screen time. And this is producing a broken generation in the United States, Canada, and Britain. I don't yet know about Korea, what effect it, uh, social media has had. But I do know that Korean children would be much healthier if they had a lot less homework and a lot more time for unsupervised play. I'm sure that resonates very strongly with most Koreans. And well, this uh, very, very uh, fast paced culture in society that we live in, um, you know, this constant need to study and work. Well, we're moving forward in this and we're being educated in that way, but uh, there's very little time to really develop like values or just any kind of vision of where we're going and where we as a society are going. And we're living in a world where the word country is actually used as a synonym of the word economy. And every year we have GDP growth targets, but not really a social vision. I mean, what kind of goals should we then really have as societies? So I, I do think uh, there's a movement within positive psychology is a movement I've been part of in psychology. <clears throat> and uh, men, some, including Martin Seligman, have done some important work to encourage countries to measure gross national happiness or flourishing. And I can give you a little bit of substance, which is to say that a good economy uh, is one that has both dynamism and decency. So the South Korean economy is very dynamic, very vibrant. That's great. Um, I, uh, but you, you have to have a, a country that gives also some sense of security, um, that gives us a sense of dignity. So you have to have dynamism <clears throat> and decency. The other thing I would say is that <clears throat> um, the key that I found, the key to happiness, in my book, The Happiness Hypothesis, I thought it was going to be just 10 separate ideas from ancient cultures. 
But the common theme of those chapters is relationships. Uh, it's the most important idea in positive psychology. You need good relationships. And our modern economy, our modern technology, certainly in the United States, and I think in Korea as well, is making people spend more and more time alone, striving to improve their public image on social media, um, and to gain uh, prestige and followers. All of these things are bad for happiness and for a sense of meaning or purpose in life. Uh, focus on relationships. Exactly, focusing on real relationships um, instead of being constantly That's interrupted right. by you know, tweets, alerts, notifications, whatnot. And well, Professor Jonathan Haidt, thank you again so much for your time today. Oh, my pleasure, Jenny. Pleasure talking with you again. Thank you also uh, very much to our viewers for tuning in. Global Insight will be back Friday, South Korea time. See you then. Hope you have a great day wherever you are. Goodbye.